and a lamp unto our feet. And we bless you for it this morning, Lord. We thank you for the blessings we've received, but we look forward to with expectation, Lord, for what you're going to do in our lives, what you're going to do to show yourself mighty in a time where this world needs to see God, where they need to see a manifestation of your goodness and your mercy. And I know, Lord, you won't leave them wanting. Praise God. And we bless you for that this morning and thank you. In Jesus' name, praise God. Give the Lord a hand this morning. Amen. Praise God. God bless you. You may be seated. Thanks, Tim, as always. Great job. I was just thinking, you know, when Jesus is talking about, if you knew what I've got, you'd be asking me for water. And he's talking about the Holy Spirit, obviously. And uh, he says, uh, he tells us that the day is going to come when out of our bellies will flow rivers of living water. Or out of our innermost being, the Holy Spirit will begin to manifest and show itself and show himself mighty. And I believe that's the days that we're living in right now. And I have every expectation. I'm like Don. I get up every morning thinking this is the day. Amen. If it isn't, I'm a day closer than I was yesterday. Praise the Lord. That's a good word. And that's the way we need to keep our focus. Amen. That God's, God's going to do what he said he's going to do. Amen. Amen. It's just a question of us believing for it. Amen. So thank the Lord for that. Amen. It's exciting. These are exciting times. Yeah, it's kind of spooky and weird, but uh, uh, amen. It makes it exciting. Because we don't know. I mean, we never did know. But we thought we did until we were forced to look at things in a different way, the way they are today that causes us to question, you know, the issues and so forth. But God's got it all together. This didn't shock him. It hasn't freaked him out. It hasn't made him wring his hands and worry. As Tim often says, it didn't come as a, uh, it didn't blindside God. He knew it was coming. He knew what it was. And he's already made us prepared to deal with any situation that the enemy can bring against us. No weapon formed against us is going to prosper. And every tongue that rises in judgment, we condemn with our own words. Amen. In agreement with God. So praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Thank you again, Mike and Suzanne, as always, doing a great job. Amen. Keeping it all together for us. And all you that are out there in the cyber world on Facebook, we appreciate you being a part of the service today. As always, amen, we've got a couple of those cyber people that are actually here in the physical today, and we appreciate that with Don and uh, Darlene being able to be here uh, for a few weeks, and we're grateful for that. But we're also grateful that when they're not here, they're still here. Praise the Lord. They're still with us, amen, in the spirit, as all of you are that are joining us this morning on Facebook. So God bless you. Appreciate it. Hope that, and believe that God's going to be a blessing to you this morning and speak to you as well. Amen. And all of you that are here today, God bless you, and thank you for being here, and stepping out in faith and trusting the Lord and coming to join together with uh, uh, saints of uh, like faith. Praise the Lord. That's a good thing. Amen. So praise God. We're excited about what God's doing. And uh, I, I shared this with, uh, Jay, or, excuse me, with uh, Darlene and Don. Uh, we had lunch together last week and um, I, I shared this with Don liked it. Now, I know Darlene isn't crazy about my punts. So I get it, but it's okay. I like her anyway, and she likes me. We're still friends. It's just the pun she doesn't like, amen. I get it. But uh, Don, I appreciate you being there with me, amen. So anyway, guy went for a checkup. And uh, afterwards, the doctor comes in with the test results, and the doctor says, I've got some bad news for you. You've got cancer and Alzheimer's. And the guy replies, well, at least I don't have cancer. <laughs> Alzheimer's, praise the Lord. Ah, praise God. You know, I had a lot of different jobs over the years, most of them in sales, and uh, although I, I worked for about 10 years in, in uh, the uh, steel industry uh, and uh, iron works, actually, but um, I was one time I was asked uh, by an interviewer to describe myself in three words, and I said, lazy. <laughs> <laughs> Praise the Lord. You guys all remember the Chernobyl thing, what a horrible situation that was. I can count the number of times that I've been to Chernobyl on one hand. Seven. <laughs> and I may be growing a tail as well, you know, Chernobyl. <laughs> Praise the Lord. I'm not sure, but I know the sevens for sure. Okay, I'm, I'm trying to be easy on you today. Well, just one more, okay? What do you call a cow with a nervous condition? Beef jerky. <laughs> God. Beef jerky. Darlene is groaning. I mean, deep down inside, I can see it. Praise God. Amen. All right. Well, thank the Lord.
again, I appreciate uh, everybody sharing this morning. So, as always, uh, it's just so right on the way the, the Lord uh, connects with us, uh, you know, spirit to spirit. And uh, so I want to talk to you about something very simple, and it's not, a, it's not deep and complex, but I do think because of conversations I've had, it's important. And that is I want to talk to you about the Holy Spirit today, the Holy Ghost. And uh, we're in a time where we need to be conscious of the working of the Holy Spirit in our lives. And I think there's a, lot of, uh, there's a lot of contradictions about that when it comes to Pentecost and different, uh, you know, religious uh, denominations. And even uh, for us individually, because of what we've been taught or, or lack of teaching. And that's what I'm going to try to deal with today. Again, I just want to make this, I want to make it simple and I want it to be usable, tangible. Something that we can actually focus on and, and get results from. And you don't have to be a deep, deep. Uh, quote unquote spiritual person to, to work with the Holy Spirit. You just have to be submitted to it. You just have to be willing to listen and to be led. It's that simple. I mean, there isn't like giants in this. It's just we're all the same. And Jesus said, if you knew what I've got for you, you would be asking me for this. And so this is the thing that's going to make the difference. The Holy Spirit, the operation of the Holy Spirit is going to make all the difference. We've, we know this. Religion's not the answer. If it was, we'd already have the answers, right? It has to be by the Spirit of God. And the only way the Spirit of God can work is through us. Because He's given us that Spirit. So that's what I want to talk to you about this morning. And uh, so to begin with, let's go to uh, 2 Corinthians. And again, Suzanne, sorry, but I've got a lot of scriptures here. Because they make more sense than I do. Amen. And I, so I just like to keep that the priority. Amen. So... Uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 1, uh, verses 20 through 22. Praise the Lord. I think uh, so many times we have relegated, and this is one of the reasons why we have these quote-unquote big-name ministries, uh, and God's really not into that. God's into His body being the ministry, that all of us are ministers. All of us, Paul said, that you would all prophesy. I would that you would all prophesy. But not just somebody with a big name that has a ministry, but everybody. Because that guy with a big name is not going to talk to the same people you are. Amen? And a lot of times, those things that we're seeing on the screen are about ministering to people who are already believers. We're in a time now where God's trying to reach the unbeliever. He's trying to reach people that were like we were before we were believers, that are looking, like Tim said this morning, that are searching, that are hungering for the reality of God in their life. And religion won't produce that. It'll just give them rules to follow that they can't follow and frustrate them. But the Holy Spirit, he, everyone that comes to God comes by the Holy Spirit. The Scripture says it's the Holy Spirit that draws us to the Father, that draws us to God or to Christ. Amen. So here he says, for all the promises of God in him, speaking of Jesus, are yea, and in him, amen, unto the glory of God by us. That's powerful. Amen. It's to the glory of God by us. We're the ones that produce this. Amen. So now he which establisheth us with you in Christ and hath anointed us is God, who hath also sealed us and given us the earnest of the Spirit in our hearts. Praise the Lord. Ephesians 1 and I want to read 2 through 14. Ephesians 1, verses 2 through 14. Praise the Lord. I think, you know, there's a part of us as humans that we want a five-step program, a three-step program, a ten-step program, some kind of a program, some, you know, just tangible path, physical thing that we can see to make all this stuff work. It just won't work that way. It, that's what religion has tried to do to get us to measure up. This is exactly what Don was talking about. Help us, Lord, to realize the greatest gift that we've got is to know we're not capable of doing this. And that forces us then to trust in what Jesus has already done. The more we try to think that I can do this, I'm not saying we shouldn't try to be decent people and moral people. I'm just saying we're going to come short. And that's where we have to keep the focus on the Lord and not on us. Because I've got some days when, man, I'm a giant when it comes to the Spirit. And I've got other days, pygmies got me beat. You know, I just can't, I can't get any, I'm upset about everything. And people irritate me and traffic and, you know, you know, like you, yeah. praise the Lord. And so that's why we've got to keep the focus on Him. We've got to know that it's our being in Him that makes the difference. 
Amen. It's what he's done and that we have embraced that changes things. Amen. So that in the dispensation of the fullness of times, he might gather together in one all things in Christ, both which are, uh, excuse me. Oh, okay. Grace be to you and peace from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ who has blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ. That's being seated in Christ, in the finished work of Jesus, right? Okay. According as he hath chosen us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love having predestinated us into the adoption of children by Jesus Christ to himself according to the good pleasure of his will, to the praise of the glory of his grace, wherein he hath made us accepted in the beloved, in whom we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins according to the riches of his grace. Not according to anything we did, according to the riches of his grace, wherein he hath abounded toward us in all wisdom and prudence, having made known unto us the mystery of his will, according to his good pleasure, which he hath purposed in himself. That in the dispensation of the fullness of times, he might gather together. Now, I believe that's where we're at. I believe that's the dispensation of grace, the dispensation where the Holy Spirit is operating, active within people. That's the fullness of the times, that he might gather together in one all things in Christ, both which are in heaven and which are on earth, even in him in whom also we have obtained an inheritance, being predestinated according to the purpose of him who worketh all things after the counsel of his own will, that we should be to the praise of his glory who first trusted in Christ, in whom ye also trusted after that ye heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also after that you believed, you were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise, which is the earnest of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession under the praise of his glory, that would be the rapture or the resurrection for us. Praise the Lord. So the evidence of the Holy Ghost, and here's like just some of the fundamental things I'm talking about here. The evidence of the Holy Ghost is not just speaking in tongues. That is an evidence. It can be an evidence of the Holy Spirit, but it's not the only evidence. Amen. It, but actually the evidence of the Holy Ghost is faith in the word of God. Because I just read you three scriptures at least that tell us it's by faith that we receive it and that God gave it to us. We didn't beg for it. We didn't get good enough and act righteous enough and holy enough to get it. It was a gift. It comes to us, amen, as a part of salvation. It is the Spirit of God. It is the Christ in you, the hope of glory. Amen. So speaking in tongues is by faith. And I don't do a lot of altar calls that way, but here I'm just saying this. If you are born again, you're a believer in Christ. You have the Holy Spirit. And the only thing that's keeping you from speaking in tongues is you. God's not going to do something more. You just have to yield to it. You just have to do it. Now, it sounds weird. It doesn't sound natural. That's why it's by faith. Because it just sounds like gibberish. I mean, even to this day, and I pray in tongues every day. Every night, usually I wake up in the middle of the night and I pray in tongues. I'm praying in tongues all during the worship. Leading up to, to, to getting up here because I know I don't have the answer. I don't have the message. I might have some notes, but I'm not, I don't have what God wants to say, and I've got to trust that God will do it in spite of me. Amen? Because that's what he does. And it's the same way with us when we interact with other people. Or just for your own edification is, is what tongues are about. It's not just that you have to have tongues in an interpretation. I very seldom get interpretations for what I'm praying in, in the Spirit. And I'm not really looking for it because I know that there's something I need to be praying about that's troubling me, and I don't know for sure what it is. Only God knows. And so when, he, when I begin to pray in tongues, then he, I get perfect prayer. I get the prayer that God has already said, I'm going to answer that prayer. All I need is somebody to release it. All I need is somebody to agree with me, right? So that's the reason for praying in tongues and speaking in tongues. It's for you. It's to build you up. It's to make the Spirit become, seem more alive to you, make it more aware to you. And everybody can do it. Now, the devil wants to keep you from praying in tongues because he knows the power that's behind it. Okay? So if you're, if you're a believer here today or watching us online and, and you know you're born again because you've accepted Christ as your Savior, you've confessed him with your mouth, amen, received him into your heart by faith and confessed him with your mouth, then you have the ability to pray in tongues, to speak in tongues. And the only thing that's stopping you is you. Either you're concerned, it's kind of like, it, it kind of reminds me of like the... Uh, the uh, communion. 
And we make it about, you know, so religion has made it about, you know, don't take this unworthily. Like what? You know, if I take this juice and this cracker uh, that's symbol uh, of Christ's body and his blood, and I do that and I'm not perfect, then God's going to curse me? Hell no. That's the reason I'm taking it. Because I am imperfect. Because I need to make the focus his blood and his body, what he's done for me, right? So the devil would love to make you think you're unworthy, don't do that. In the same way, it comes to tongues because that will bless you just as communion can bless you and heal you and bring you revelation. Tongues can do the very same thing. And so you need to have the boldness. You, you know, go off by yourself. You don't have to prove this to anybody. This is just between you and the Lord anyway. So just do it and see, amen, what kind of... Results you can get. See, see the difference that it'll make over time. Now, I'm not saying the devil won't come and say, that's just you talking. Because he does. That's what he does. He wants you to focus on the physical thing about it rather than the spiritual side of it. Just tell him to shut up and go away, and you continue to pray in tongues. And if you continue to pray in tongues, you won't have to ask him to leave. He'll run like his hair is on fire if he has hair. Amen? You know what I'm saying? So that, I, I'm, I just want to settle that first of all. If you're not praying in tongues, pray in tongues. If you're a believer, just do it. Just start doing it and see that it will bring about differences. It will bring about changes, amen, in the way that you perceive. Because for one thing, it makes you conscious of the Holy Spirit while you're doing it. I mean, you're depending on this, right? And that's why it's an act of faith. If it, wasn't, if it didn't take faith, in other words, if you just did it and felt like, whoa, man, I got, look at me, I'm talking in tongues. No, the reason you struggle with your thoughts and your mind is because it is an act of faith. It is faith that's doing it. And the Spirit is, is, has anointed you to do it, but your mind wants to keep it suppressed so that you don't get the benefit. And whoever it is you may be praying for in the Spirit isn't getting the benefit either. And that's the bigger issue that we're dealing with. Amen. So speaking in tongues is an evidence of the Holy Spirit, but it's not the Holy Spirit. It's just an evidence. The Holy Spirit you've already got. So you don't have to pray in tongues to have the Holy Spirit. But to get the benefit, some of the benefits that the Holy Spirit has for you, you need to pray in tongues. Tongues is not the Holy Ghost. It's just an evidence. Amen. Okay, so everybody that's born again has the ability to speak in tongues. You have the capacity or the ability to speak in tongues. If you're born again, amen, and you do it by faith because it's a gift of grace, amen, and what it does is it acknowledges His presence in us, amen. It has, it, it's a powerful thing. It isn't just gibberish. It isn't just, you know, so I sound like I'm holier than somebody else. Because I, I, I don't know that I ever pray in tongues around anybody else. If I do, it's accidental. You know, I mean, it just comes on you sometimes. And you can't kind of quite, you can help yourself if you want to, but you just kind of go with the flow. But I'm not trying to impress anybody or prove anything to anybody. This is between me and God, and I know that it makes a difference. Because it has for 30-some years of my life. Amen? So let's look at now Romans chapter 5, verses 1 through 6. Romans 5, 1 through 6. So if you're watching online or if you're here with us and you're born again, you've accepted Christ as your Savior. Amen. You've confessed Him with your mouth, believed in your heart. You have the ability to pray in tongues. You have the Holy Spirit. It's just a question of whether or not you're going to get the benefit of it. Amen. Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom also we have access by faith into this grace wherein we stand and rejoice in hope of the glory of God. And not only so, but we glory in tribulations also, knowing that tribulation worketh patience, and patience experience and experience hope. And hope maketh not ashamed, because the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost, which is given unto us. And this is what Don was talking about, too, and from what I got from it, is that the tribulation's just part of being in this world. Amen? So God uses it then to develop us. Right? He doesn't use it to punish us 
He's not putting tribulation on us, but he just knows as long as we're in this fallen world, there's going to be some tribulation. There's going to be fallen issues that we have to deal with. And so instead of looking at as as an attack that's going to overcome us, we need to see it for what it really is, and that is something that builds us up and makes us stronger because now we depend more on the Holy Spirit than we do on ourselves. Amen? So hope maketh not ashamed, but because the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost, which is given to us, not earned, not purchased, but given. Amen? For when we were yet without strength, in due time Christ died for the ungodly. That would be us. Praise the Lord. All right. John 14 and verse 26. But the Comforter, which is the Holy Ghost, whom the Father will send in my name. That's why we get the, the description Christ in you or uh, the hope of glory or that uh, you and Christ are one. It's, he's, the Holy Spirit's what we're talking about here. It's the Spirit of God. The same spirit that dwelt in Jesus as a man who walked the face of this earth, okay? He'll send in my name. He'll, he shall teach you all things and bring all things to your remembrance whatsoever I have said unto you. So the Holy Spirit will quicken the word of God to you. Scriptures, you know, there's stuff in our mind that we have no clue. I, I mean, there's stuff I learned in third grade. I don't know what it was. I don't remember any of it. But yet, if I ever needed it, it's there. It's, it's in my mind. It's, it's, your mind is like a computer, uh, you know, memory bank. And so we've got a lot of information, a lot of revelation that's stored in our mind. And the Holy Ghost can quicken that back to you when it's needed. You can't do that just automatically, randomly say, well, I want to remember something that happened 40 years ago. No, but the Holy Spirit can bring it back to you just when you need it. When you're, like Don was saying, when you're having that conversation with somebody else, when you're trying to share God, you know, it, it would absolutely do nothing but make a fool out of me if I were to walk up to some unbeliever and just start praying in tongues and start talking in tongues. Right? Unless the Holy Spirit moved so mightily at that moment that that person would be able to receive it. But under normal circumstances, that's the last thing you want to do because they have no clue what you're talking about. They just think you're an idiot, right? Now, and I'll get to that later, but that's why we have to be led by the Spirit. We have to know God will quicken things to us. What needs to be said to that person? Something that maybe you don't know anything about or something that happened to you a long time ago and he'll just quicken it back to you at that moment and you'll share it and they'll go, oh man, yeah, that's, that's what I'm dealing with, you know? And they recognize there's something going on here just besides you and them. There's another force at work. Amen. That's where the Holy Spirit comes in. Praise the Lord. But we have to be sensitive. We've got to be willing to take those risks when the Holy Spirit moves on us. Amen. That means we have to be conscious of his presence. Right. But the comforter, which is the Holy Ghost, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things. Now, there's a lot of things that we've read here, but it hasn't really been taught to us. You know what I'm saying? I mean, we've gone through the years of reading and studying and so forth. And some of it is just information, but it really wasn't taught to us. It's just there. But the Holy Spirit wants to teach us. Right? He wants to really elevate the understanding of each and every one of us. Teach you all things and bring all things to your remembrance whatsoever I have said unto you. All right? Now, Romans 8 and verse 1. And so he says, there is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the spirit. And there's multiple ways of translating that, but one of them is who live in union with him. In other words, you're conscious of your relationship with him. That would make you conscious of the Holy Spirit because it's his spirit that is now dwelling in us. We're in him. He's in us. Right. And that's what he's trying to tell us here. There is no condemnation. The only time we get condemnation is when we step outside of our identity in Christ. And then all of, me, all of a sudden we're, you know, inundated with all of our weaknesses, all of our failings, all of our shortcomings. Amen. All of our fears and anxieties and everything else. And that's why he says there's no condemnation to those who live in union with him, who are conscious and aware of his presence. And that's the Holy Spirit. Amen. So now Christ works through men by the Spirit. And the Spirit, like the Father is unseen because it is God. <laughs> I know it, gets, it can get weird, but you know what I'm talking about. God was in Christ. The fullness of the Godhead was in Jesus Christ, the man. 
So he had the Holy Spirit, which is God. So it can get, you know, it sounds like we're contradicting ourselves, but hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one. There are manifestations, but there's just one God, and he's invisible and nobody's seen him. All we've seen is a physical human who carried the fullness of the Godhead in him, the first man to do that, right? And the only man to do it without sin. So his ministry, although it's unseen, is to reveal the fullness of the Godhead to man and through man. His, his, his purpose hasn't changed one bit from the very beginning. Amen? So that ministry began on the day of Pentecost. Amen? And it, the ministry that we're talking about today. And it continues until the second coming of Jesus. Amen? The dispensation of grace is the dispensation in which the Holy Spirit operates in its fullness. Before the dispensation of grace, the Holy Spirit would move on people. Could not be with them, could not dwell with them, could not lead them in that way. It would just move upon that person momentarily or temporarily. But now God has said, I'll never leave you or forsake you. I am a part of you. Amen. Like the songs that we sing. He's the air that I breathe. He, he's the words that I speak. He is all in all. Amen. And so this operation is being carried out right now. And it's being carried out in us and through us. And it will continue till it's completed. Until it has done what God intended it for it to do. Amen. And so this ministry of the Holy Ghost is just as real. It's just as definite as was the incarnation and earthly ministry of Jesus himself. Amen. Amen. It's just that now it's in us instead of in Jesus. It's real. It's definite. It's had a starting and it'll have an ending. Praise the Lord. It may seem vague. So now here's, the, here's the issue that we have. It seems mysterious, right? Because there hasn't been a revelation of the Spirit to the physical senses like there was of Christ. That's why Christ came for crying out loud, because we could not connect with an invisible God. We couldn't get our heads wrapped around it. We couldn't make sense out of it, right? And so God comes in the form of a man so that we have tangible, connective kind of ways of looking at it. And that's the problem with the Holy Spirit is we don't have that with the Holy Spirit, right? We have it with Jesus. I mean, we can make images of Christ. I mean, we've got him paint his pictures. What color is he? You know, I mean, come on. That's not the point. The point is we can relate to him because he's a human being. Right. And we can make, you know, images in our own mind of what he is or looked like or whatever. That, that's irrelevant. But the fact that he's real, that he's flesh, right? That he's flesh and bone. Amen. So Jesus' ministry demanded that he become a man in order to legally take our place. Right? I mean, he, the reason God had to become a man was because it had to be a man that got punished for what man had done. Yes. Right? And so he was revealed to the physical senses of man. Right? Now look at 1 John chapter 1, verses 1 and 2. and he, he, He's explaining this to us uh, in multiple places throughout the scripture, but here's a perfect example. And the, the disciples are saying, that which was from the beginning, which we have heard. Now he's talking about God, which was from the beginning. The, I'm talking about the, the invisible God. Now we know Jesus was from the beginning, right? He was with God. He was God. That's what the scripture says. But that which was from the beginning, which we have heard. Now we heard about this. We read about it. But we never had any connection with it. Which we have now seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon, and our hands have handled of the word of life. He's saying, we've got evidence now. We've got physical evidence. We've seen him. We touched him. We walked with him. We talked with him. Praise the Lord. For the life was manifested, and we have seen it, and bear witness, and show unto you that eternal life, which was with the Father, and was manifested unto us. So he's giving us physical evidence so that we can relate to it the same way they did. We saw it. We touched it. You can trust me. I've seen it. It isn't just something, a figment of my imagination. It wasn't a dream I had. He was a guy, a man, who looked like us. But he was full of the Holy Ghost. He was full of the Spirit of God. And that's what we, that's what we attach ourselves to. That's, what, that's why it's easier. I'm not saying it's easy, but it's easier to, to connect with Jesus, the reality of Jesus, than it is the Holy Spirit. A lot of evidence. A lot of... Right? So Christ, as a man, could be seen. He could be touched by men. Right? 
And because of that, his ministry has been more real to us than the ministry of the Holy Ghost, who can't be contacted through the physical senses. You can't see him. You can't smell him. You can't hear him with your ears. You can hear him, but it has to be by the Spirit. And if you're not aware and not believing that you have access to this, even when he's speaking, you're not going to hear him. Because you're going to think it's just your thought. You had this thought. Somebody said something. Right? It has to, you have to be connected and aware of his presence in order to really interact. So, I mean, we can form a mental picture of Jesus, like I was saying. But not the Holy Ghost, because he's invisible. You can't make up a picture of something that's unseeable. Right? So Christ came as a man to substitute, to be the substitute, to pay the penalty of Adam's rebellion and, of course, all of us that followed in, in Adam's uh, progenity, right? So he's been revealed to us as a man in a body like ours, one that we can relate to, amen? And his ministry was local. He couldn't be everywhere at the same time. He was a man. He could only minister one place at one time. He could only be in one place at one time. Amen? And the Holy Spirit came to impart the nature of God to the spirit of man. Amen? He quickens our spirit, or he makes our spirit alive, and then he comes and dwells in it to, to transform our human spirit into the likeness of God. Again, that's kind of difficult to understand because God's invisible, but he's talking about the nature, that our nature would be the same as God's. Right? When we get born again, that's what happens. The truth is, see, we are invisible. It's the only thing about us that's ever going to die is what is visible. And then God's going to give us a glorified body which is visible, but it's also a spirit body. That isn't subject to the things of the physical body. Amen? So the Holy Spirit came to impart the nature of God to our spirit. He didn't come in a human body, but he came to dwell in the bodies of humans who had become the new creation in Christ. Yes. He didn't come to do something different. He came to do the same thing that he did in Jesus, but he's going to do it in the entire body of Christ. As he was in the physical body of Jesus, he now is in the body of Christ, the church, or the believers. Amen? Amen. So he didn't come for any reason other than to indwell us the same as he had indwelled Jesus, the man. Amen? But his coming was a positive. It was just as real. It was just as positive as the coming of Jesus in his incarnation. It's the same thing. It's the same thing. That's why it's called being born again. Born of the Spirit. Praise the Lord. I mean, John 14, uh, verses 16 to 20. And I'm, I hope that I'm just not talking to myself, but I, I hope that, because I, I know there are a lot of Christians who are not taking advantage of the Holy Spirit. They're not praying in tongues. They're not speaking in tongues. They're not being led by the Holy Spirit because they think it's something deeper. They think it's something more. It, it, it takes more of me. It doesn't. It just takes you re relinquishing your thoughts to Him. Amen? And Jesus saith unto him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but by me. If you had known me, you should have known my Father also, and from henceforth you know him and have seen him. So Jesus is just saying, now you know he exists because you're seeing a physical manifestation of this. Right? Philip said unto him, Lord, show us the Father, and it sufficeth him. Now Jesus is not talking about if we had a, a photograph of him, we'd see what God looks like. No, he's saying what I do, the things that I say, the things that I do, they are a revelation of God. They are revealing God to you. And, you, and, and in a way that you can relate to because it's coming from a human being. It makes God real in a way that he couldn't seem real to you otherwise, right? And so that's what he's trying to explain. Jesus said unto him, Have I been so long time with you, and yet have thou not known me, Philip? He that has seen me has seen the Father, and now how sayest thou then, show us the Father? Believest thou not that I am in the Father, and the Father in me? The words that I speak unto you, I speak not of myself, but the Father that dwelleth in me, he doeth the works. He said, I'm revealing him by the words and the works that I'm doing. Yes. Amen. Believe me that I'm in the Father and the Father in me, or else believe me just because of the works. 
right? Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that believeth on me the works that I do, shall he do also, and greater works than these shall he do, because I go to my Father. Why? Because now I can send back that same Spirit that's been dwelling in me, the fullness of the Godhead, to you. And you can do the same works, and even greater works. If whatever is necessary, you'll be able to do it. And whatsoever you ask in my name, that will I do that the Father may be glorified in the Son. I talked about that last week. It isn't just the, the repetitious kind of saying of, in Jesus' name. That's, there's nothing wrong with saying in Jesus' name, but the idea is for us to, to connect with Jesus. That when, when I'm praying for people, I'm praying the same as Jesus. I have the same ability. I have the same, uh, the same power because I have the same spirit in me. And so when I'm praying it, I'm praying in Jesus' name because it's Jesus that's doing the work. Now, I can say in Jesus' name if that makes somebody feel more comfortable. But the truth is, I, whatever I'm doing, I'm doing in Jesus' name because I have received him. Amen. That's the new name we've got. Amen. And so he says, if you ask anything in my name, I'll do it. If you love me, keep my commandments. And I will pray the Father, and he shall give you another comforter, that he may abide with you forever. Even the Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive. Why? Because it can't see him. <coughs> Neither knoweth him, but you know him, for he dwelleth with you and shall be in you. Now this is you know, pre-death, uh, burial, and resurrection that he's talking about. He's saying he's with you now. But he will be in you once I go to the Father and send him back, right? I will not leave you comfortless. I will come to you. Now, again, if you're thinking of this in terms of, like, different gods, it can get confusing. But he's saying, I'm coming back to you. Just like I came to Jesus, I'm going back to the Father. I'm going back to my original position. And I'm going to send back that same spirit that was in me physically to you. Now, Jesus is a man. He's still a man. Yes, he is. But he's got a glorified body and he's in heaven. Right? And when he sends back that same spirit, the fullness of the Godhead, he sends back to dwell in us now. So, yet a little while, and the world seeth me no more. But you'll see me. Has anybody here seen Jesus? No, that's not, because that's not what he's talking about. He's talking about the spiritual knowledge, the spiritual awareness. And the world's not ever going to see it. Because it's invisible. You have to see it by the Spirit. He bears witness with your spirit. That's why we're here today. Right? I mean, that's the reason we come together. That's the reason we believe. Amen? We believe because we can't help but believe. It's like Tim has said. Others have, have, have said this too. You can talk to me about theology all you want, but you can't take away what I've experienced. You can't make that not true. You can argue all you want to about your religion or lack of religion or atheism or whatever it might be, but you can't, you can't take from me what I have already experienced. And that's that person. That's the relationship. That's the reality of God. Amen? And that's what makes it so powerful. Because once that happens, as Don said, and I mentioned it last week, where are you going to go? To whom would we turn? Once you know that there's a God, where are you going to go? Even if you don't understand it, are you going to just get mad and go, no, not unless you're a complete idiot, because there isn't any place else to go. He has the answers. He is the life, right? And so the world seeth me no more, but you see me because I live, you're going to live also. At that day, you will know that I am in my Father. Now, he's still talking to disciples who have not received the Holy Spirit yet. And so he's saying in the day, that day when I send back my Holy Spirit, that's when you're going to know that I'm in my Father and that you are in me and that I'm in you. He's going to say, we wrap the whole ball back up to still one God and he's still dwelling in you. Yes, that God manifests himself in different ways. But hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one. Yes. Amen. And that God is dwelling inside of you right now. Woo! Hallelujah. I mean, the God that spoke everything into existence, the God who sustains everything. Amen. He is in you. That is the Holy Spirit that dwells in you and wants to be revealed to you first and then to everybody that you come into contact with. Praise the Lord. Yeah. You'll know me and I'll know you and we'll know that we're one. You can't. I mean, that's hard to get across intellectually, you know, with words. But don't we all know that? I mean, it's, we know it by the Spirit, right? We may not be able to say all this stuff the way it needs to be said, but we know, we just know. 
Right? It's, a, it's revelation knowledge that comes only by the Spirit. And nobody can take that away from you. That's the beauty of it. The devil, I'm telling you, I don't, I, I don't want to have to be martyred. But I'll tell you this, if I have to be, I will be. You know why? Not because I'm brave, not because I'm courageous, but because His grace will be sufficient. His Spirit will build me up and give me the strength that I need at that moment, if that moment comes. And He'll do the same thing for every one of us. That's why it's so hard to project ourselves into those situations and think, what would I do? Well, we have no clue what we would do because we're not there. But how many times have we gone through things in life that we thought, if I didn't know the Lord, I don't know what I'd be doing. That's, that's Mark and Laura. And that's countless other people who have lost loved ones and who have unexplainable tragedies and experiences. And yet, they're hanging on to Jesus. Because it's real. It's real in the ways that other things can't be real, no matter how much. You know, it's like the difference, I'm going to get really gross here, but it's the difference between love and sex. Praise the Lord. I get myself in a lot of trouble here, but I'm just saying, you know, when you're in love with somebody, sex can enhance, you know what I'm saying? It can enhance that relationship because of the closeness of it. But just sex alone, it doesn't bring anything other than a moment. There's no intimacy. There's no, you know what I'm saying? And that's the way it is with the Holy Ghost. God wants us to have more than just a, a little fling. He wants us to be one. He wants us to know that we're loved, that we love. And it's important that it, that it connects in a way that nothing else can. Religion will give you a little romp. It'll give you a weekend away. Trouble is, you're going to wake up and look at and go, what the hell? Where did that come from? <laughs> How did I end up with this? Right? Because now it's all about the physical stuff, the, the things that you got to do. It, it's not about the tenderness or the love or the couple. I know I got people laughing. I'll bet you there's people either flipping those dials off right now. They go, where in the world is this idiot going? Sorry, I got my own problems, and they come out every <laughs> once in a while when I preach. <laughs> Praise the Lord. All right. Uh, let's go to first, uh, chapter 15 and verses 26 and 27 before I make a complete idiot out of myself. And my wife gets up and runs out. Praise the Lord. She's, believe me, she knows. We're not going to surprise her with any, anything about me. But when the Comforter has come, whom I will send unto you from the Father, even the Spirit of truth which proceedeth from the Father, he will testify of me. In other words, when you get born again, what happens? You get the Holy Spirit. And he validates the reality of the experience that you've had. Even though intellectually and theologically you may not be able to explain it all and figure it all out, but yet there's something, there's a knowing, amen, of the witness, amen, of His Spirit and your spirit. So the Spirit of truth, which proceeds from the Father, He testifies to us that it's real, right? And you also will bear witness because you have been with me from the beginning. We were in Christ before the foundation of the world. Amen? When the Comforter has come, whom I will send unto you from the Father, even the Spirit of truth which proceedeth from the Father, he will testify to me. And you also will bear witness because you have been with me from the beginning. So when we reconnect with him, we know this is where I was supposed to be. We not, may not have all the answers and may not feel like we know how to do it all, but we know this is where I belong. This is where I was supposed to be. This is what I've been searching for. This is the thing that I'm trying to figure out. This thing that, that makes life meaningful and valuable. Gee, you know, Elvis Presley, God knows he, he had some problems, but he did. He was a believer. You know, if you look at it from a religious perspective, you say, are you kidding me? I mean, the guy's on drugs. He's doing all this stuff. Look, he was a believer. He was weak. He was a human, but he was still a believer and had sense enough to say, as Tim said, there's only one king and it ain't Elvis. I'm, a, I'm an entertainer. You know, that's what he's saying. He's king. Amen. Keep your focus on him. No. Amen. So look, get the, in the, in the, think about the Holy Spirit this way. In the creation of the physical world, the Holy Ghost imparted life. It imparted form and power to develop dead and formless matter. That's what the Holy Spirit was doing. Look at the Genesis 1 and 2. He said there was chaos, there was confusion, there was darkness. 
but the Holy Spirit hovered. The earth was without form and void. Darkness was upon the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God moved upon this chaos. Right? And he brought life. He brought form. He brought power. That's what the Holy Ghost wants to do in our lives. The same thing he did in creation. Amen? He gave revelation and inspiration to all the old covenant pro prophets. Look at, uh, let's just quickly at Matthew 16, 16 through 19. Pro uh, Matthew 16, 16 through 19. This is what the Holy Spirit does. He inspired old covenant promises. Well, that's exactly what he did with Simon Peter. Jesus said, who do men say that I am? And Simon Peter, well, some said this, one said some other. But Simon Peter answered and said, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. Or you are God manifest in the flesh. You are the Messiah. And Jesus answered and said unto him, blessed art thou, Simon Barjona, because you didn't get this from intellect. You didn't get this from religion. It wasn't revealed to you that way. But my Father, which is in heaven, or the Spirit of God, right? He revealed it. And I say unto you that thou art Peter, and upon this rock, upon revelation, knowledge, by the Holy Spirit, he said, I'm going to build a church. Now, think about it. He built his church built based on revelation, knowledge, by the Holy Spirit, and, and three-fourths of the church doesn't even believe in the Holy Spirit. I'm talking about religiously speaking. Not, I'm not talking about the body of Christ, because obviously they do. But you, you see why it has been unproductive? Why it hasn't produced what God has said? Because it hasn't believed what God said. Amen. But he said, I'll, 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 upon this rock, upon the revelation of the Holy Spirit revealing things to you. And, and that what he said later on, he goes on to say that I'll, I'm going to send back the comforter and he's going to reveal everything that I've said to you. He's going to make it true. He's going to make you remember it. Amen. So you can work with it. So you can operate in it. Amen. He said, I'm going to build my church on that, on this Holy Spirit revelation, and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. Yeah. If we operate in this, hell has no opportunity to function wherever we are. Just like Jesus, wherever he went, he went about, amen, loosing those who were bound by the devil, whether it was sickness and disease or whatever it might have been. Why? And how did he do it? He said, it's not me that's doing this. It's the Holy Spirit. It's the Spirit of God. It's the Father that's in me. Who's doing the works? And it's the same way with us. When we lay hands and somebody gets healed, just like with Don and Jane, for example. Don didn't heal Jane, and Jane didn't heal Jane, but it was the God that was in them, amen, that healed her. He set them free, just like the same way. He needs a man to do it. He needs a woman to do it. But it's the Holy Spirit that does the healing. And the revelation they had of the Holy Spirit is what made it possible to even pray the prayer or to confess it, Right? So I will give unto you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatever you bind on earth. Now listen to this now. This is what happens when we operate by the Holy Spirit. We bind, and we loose. We don't react to what the devil does. We loose things onto him, and we bind things off of us and others. By the Holy Spirit. That's what he said. That, that revelation of the Holy Spirit operating in your life gives you power to bind and to loose. Bind whatever's not in heaven, I'm binding that here. Loosing whatever's in heaven, I'm loosing it here. Amen? <laughs> Praise the Lord. Amen. 1 Peter 1, 10 through 12. Just a continuation of this same thought now in, in 1 Peter uh, 1, 10 and 12. Of which salvation the prophets have inquired and search diligently who prophesied of the grace that should come unto you. See, the Holy Spirit would move on them, and they would prophesy stuff, but they didn't understand it. Because they didn't have the witness in the Holy Spirit. They just had the ability to say what the Holy Spirit was saying without making the connection to them personally, right? Searching what, or what manner of time, the Spirit of Christ which was in them did signify when it testified beforehand the sufferings of Christ and the glory that should follow. Unto whom it was revealed, that not unto themselves, that they weren't going to get this gift, right? But unto us, they did minister the things. So when we read the Old Testament, they weren't talking about things that they were going to have in terms of the Holy Spirit. They were ministering to us, the people who would come, who would then become the recipients of the Holy Spirit. Just like Jesus, right? So which are now reported unto you by them that have preached the gospel unto you with the Holy Ghost... 
So when Paul and them were preaching all this Old Testament stuff, because they didn't have a New Testament when they were preaching it, they were preaching what the Holy Spirit had overshadowed men and women to, to say or to do. And then he says, we come along and preach the gospel unto you with the Holy Ghost sent down from heaven, which things the angels desire to look into. The angels don't even understand this stuff. Amen? That's why the devil is so hateful towards us. He thinks man is a lesser thing, a, 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 a nothing, a, a, a get in the way thing. And we are until we connect with God. And then we are the biggest slap in the devil's face. And, and he knows it because it's a repetition or a repeat of what Jesus did on the cross. Yes. Binds him. Amen? The Holy Spirit is received by faith. Period. You got to just believe it. Galatians chapter 3 and 2. Now you may have somebody lay hands on you and you receive the Holy Spirit. Nothing wrong with that. It's biblical. But you don't have to have anybody laying hands on you. If you're a believer in Christ, you have the Holy Spirit. Now it's just a question of whether or not you're going to acknowledge it. Right? So this only would I learn of you, Paul asked. These, these religious people who were born again. And he said, I, I just got one thing I want to ask you. Because they're all running around trying to do all kinds of religious stuff. And in fact, they were making churches were going nuts because they were talking in tongues. But they didn't know why they were talking in tongues. And they were just rattling and making chaotic uh, noises and everything else. And Paul had to rebuke them at a point where he said, look, you know, I get it. You can pray in tongues. But if, if you're just praying in tongues, then do it personally, privately, because it's for your edification. It isn't for everybody else just to know that you can speak in tongues. Right? If you're going to do it in church, do it in a way where there can be a, uh, a, a, a trans, translate, not a translation, but a interpretation. interpretation so that the people who are there who don't have the Holy Spirit, who cannot make the connection, will receive what God's trying to say to them. Amen? So that's, that's only what I learned of you. He said, receive you the Spirit by the works of the law, by religion, or by the hearing of faith. You heard and you believed and you received. Praise the Lord. Verse uh, 14. That the blessing of Abraham might come on the Gentiles through Jesus Christ. That was how the Spirit was going to come. He had to come, die, send back the Spirit through Jesus Christ that we might receive the promise of the Spirit through faith. Right? God promised that He was going to send the, the, the Spirit or the Messiah was going to come and it would be the seed of Abraham. And He's telling us not seeds, but the seed, which is Christ and the Holy Spirit. There's one Holy Spirit. There's all kinds of people that have the Holy Spirit, but there's only one Holy Spirit. Right? There isn't like 150 billion or whatever there is on planet Earth. It's the Holy Spirit. There's one Holy Spirit. But He can f totally fill each one of us. The The entire Godhead can be in each one of us. Praise the Lord. So the Holy Spirit works through the Word. Right? We know in the beginning, the Holy Spirit overshadowed. The Spirit began to cause things to happen. And what happened? God began to speak. The Holy Spirit, says he, it says He overshadowed. He saw the chaos. He saw the, the confusion. Amen. He saw all that and he overshadowed it or he began to put into action the mind of God or what God wanted to do with the earth and God began to speak it. Now let me, <laughs> this is crazy, but just think about it. God is this spirit and this, and this spirit is thinking. Right, this isn't what I want. I'm, I mean, I'm making up language here for God, but you know what I'm saying? He's witnessing the spirit in uh, of God is witnessing this and he says that something needs to be done about this I, I, I'm going to release uh, revelation so that there will be some form, so that there will be some power, so that there will be some things besides this chaos and darkness and, and so then how does he do it? He, the spirit quickens this to him and then he begins to speak right? light S the seas separate you, are you getting what I'm saying? Uh, so I'm saying God, and it works the same way in us because we have the same God in us. So we get this unction or this urge or this desire to speak to something that's all messed up. But we don't do it. Jesus said that's how it works. When you feel that, this isn't right. This is the way it's supposed to be. Then you need to start... 
and loosing. You need to start acting like who you are. You need to start speaking like who you are because words have power. Not just random words, but words that are backed by the Holy Spirit. They change everything. Amen? They are the keys to the kingdom of God. And the gates of hell cannot prevail against them. See, we're, cry we're crying out and praying to God and pleading with God, and God's saying, come on, guys. You're me in that earth. You've got to start operating like me. You've got to start functioning like me. That's why I sent back the Holy Spirit. And the church and religion has made people tentative about operating in the Spirit or believing that they could even have the Spirit. Why? For the same reasons that Don spoke about and all of us have, that we're not worthy. Of course we're not worthy. That's why we had to be born again. The moment you got born again, He put His Spirit in you to declare to you, you are the righteousness of God in Christ because God cannot dwell where there's sin. So He cleanses you. Not your flesh, your spirit, because that's where His Spirit dwells. Praise the Lord. We are the instruments that the Holy Spirit uses. Just think about it. Suzanne mentioned this a couple weeks ago too, and I was thinking about it ever since. Because the word of reconciliation has been given to us. What did Jesus come here for? To reconcile man to God. To let them know God's not mad at you. God wants, to, wants you to know He loves you. He wants you to be with Him. He wants you to be one with Him. And so when Jesus left, He's not reconciling people to God anymore. He gave us the word of reconciliation when He gave us the Holy Spirit. Because it was the Holy Spirit that was trying to reconcile people back to God. Right? So, look, let's look at it quickly. We'll just read it. Uh, 2 Corinthians 5, 18 and 19. And, and you know, the church, what the, what, again, what religion has done, I'm interchanging the church with religion. It's not true. It's not fair. But... Um, the church is one thing and religion is another. But I'm just saying, what, what religion has done is tried to make you think that and the only way you're going to be able to reconcile anybody to God is to be as holy as Jesus. Duh. That's exactly what God did. He made us holy as Jesus. Right? But we think, in terms of the natural, we think, well, yeah, but man, I screwed this up, and I just act like a fool, and now I'm going to win somebody to Jesus after that stupid thing I said or that stupid thing I did. Yep, because it's the Spirit that's going to draw them. He just needs you to be a willing vessel. He just needs you to, to submit. Amen. Now, look, none of us are going to get perfect in this life, not, not in the flesh. We can try to be better. We can try to... But it, the moment we make that about whether God's going to use us or not, we have just cut God off from our life. We've cut off any influence that He could have through us and by us. Praise the Lord. So all things are of God who hath reconciled us to Himself by Jesus Christ and hath given to us the ministry of reconciliation. To wit, that God was in Christ. Now, he, now He's telling us how it works. And here's how it works, he says. That God was in Christ reconciling the world unto himself. That's what he's doing in us. Not imputing their trespasses unto them and hath committed unto us the word of reconciliation. Now look around the world today. There's all kinds of people that we could easily hate. Right? And really be at odds with and, and, and be bitter against and angry towards. And who knows? No matter who you are. There's stuff like that. Now, what is, what is God telling us? We need to function the way Jesus functioned, by grace. Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. Stephen looks up and sees Jesus standing at the right hand of the Father, and he says, don't lay this to their charge. I'm telling you, that takes the Holy Spirit. Because there's a part of all of us that wants to just slap somebody upside the head and tell them, get a clue. Grow up. Act like you're an adult. You know, act like you've got some good sense. And God is saying, no, that's not the answer. Because the truth is, they already know all of that. And that's one of the reasons they're acting the way they're acting. Self-hatred. Self-loathing. Insecurity. Doubt. And what did Jesus do? He went about setting them free. 
He went about loving every one of them. Now, he might correct them, but it was always with love, just like Tim said. You hear the voice, and you don't hear, hey, idiot, get your act together. No, it's, look, son, there's a God who loves you and wants your life to be blessed, wants you to have all the good things that you see others having and wonder why you don't have it. But somebody's got to verbalize this. Because they're not going to go read the Bible. And if they did, it would just be like a foreign language to them anyway. It is the Holy Spirit that draws people to God. And it's the Holy Spirit in you that's going to do that. But you've got to operate by the same grace that Jesus does. You can't come with an attitude to somebody and, and think that you're going to win them to Jesus. That's what religion does. And it turns everybody off. Well, get your act together. Clean up. Quit smoking. Quit drinking. Quit going. Quit doing. Quit that. And then maybe God will do something for you. Probably not, because you'll think you earned it now. Praise God. The Holy Spirit's residence on earth, His home, is the body of Christ. Just as it was the person of Christ initially. Now it's the entire body. Right? Just as Christ's physical body was the temple of God while He was here on earth, His body now, the church is the temple of the Holy Spirit now. That's how much He identifies with us as His body. Yes. Praise the Lord. Ephesians 2, 21 and 22. See, the beauty of this is, the, the least shall be the greatest. The ones who think they have absolutely nothing they could do for God. And God saying, you could do everything if you would just trust me and act in faith. In whom all the building fitly framed together groweth unto a holy temple in the Lord. In whom ye also are builded together for a habitation of God through the Spirit. That's the church. And the church is me. And the church is all of us. I can take the church anywhere I go. Right? But the church can be everywhere at the same time. Which Jesus could never do. He was limited. But the church isn't. It's all over the face of the earth. Maybe more in some places than others, but it's everywhere. Amen? 1 Corinthians 6, 19 and 20. What? What? Doesn't that sound like some language we'd hear today? What? Know you not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost which is in you? which you have of God, and ye are not your own? What? <laughs> huh? What? Know you not your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost, which is in you, which you have of God, and you are not your own? For you are bought with a price. Therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. Praise the Lord. God has become incarnated in the church. He did the same thing He did in Jesus. He's done it in us. That's what Jesus was explaining to us when He went away. God was in Christ, and He said, He who has seen Me has seen the Father. And He's told us, now I'm gonna, God's going to be incarnate in you. And we should be able to say, if you've seen Me, you've seen the Father. Woo! Hallelujah. That'll, that'll get your tongue tied. That'll make you question, you know, everything about you. But that's, it is made to be so radical that it forces us to think otherwise, to think outside the box. If you're going to believe that, you've got to quit thinking about the, you the way you have always thought about you. You've got to start thinking about you the way God thinks about you. Perfect, righteous, holy, a vessel of honor that can hold the Spirit of God. And not only hold the Spirit of God, but release that same Spirit to other people. Yes. Praise the Lord. Jesus said, He that seen me has seen the Father. And you know, that was the first time that God was actually revealed to man. I mean, in His fullness. Now, there had been glimpses, and Moses and others saw His hinder parts and all these kind of things. But this was the first time when Jesus was, was born. Amen. That was the first time that God was visible. Now, after the resurrection and the ascension, God has become incarnate in the church. He's alive. And He can be seen 
if we reveal him. And the only way we can reveal him is by the Holy Spirit or by God's Spirit. And it's because, or, or so, that the revelation of God to man will continue. That it didn't end with Jesus. It's supposed to go on until the second coming. Ephesians 3, 19 and 20. Praise the Lord. I know I'm long today. But I can't say the stuff I want to say in a way that makes any sense to me and hopefully to somebody else. I know, because I know by the Spirit, there are people that are struggling with this. That are not operating in the Spirit. And they're frustrated. And it starts with the tongues. And all the rest of it follows. Because they don't feel worthy. Because they haven't been religious enough. Because they do this or they do that and the other. I mean, we've got to quit thinking about ourselves the way we have always thought about ourselves. God's desperate enough to give his own life so that this thing could be worldwide. So that it could be more than just one man in one place ministering, but so that God could literally be omnipresent again. I mean, in a tangible way. I know he's omnipresent. I know he's everywhere, but I'm talking about in a way that men can interact with him and see him and, and be touched by him. To know the love of Christ, which passes knowledge, that we might be filled with all the fullness of God. Now unto him that is able to do exceeding abundantly above all that we ask or think, according to the power that worketh in us. Yes. Praise God. Christ has no contact. Now listen to what I'm saying. I mean this, I know it, it, it sounds almost blasphemous, but the truth is, Jesus Christ has no contact with this world today except through us. Except through his body. He can't work independently of it. Because those are the parameters that he set on himself. Now God can do anything, but this is the, this is the way he set it up. And people are waiting for Jesus to come and do something, and Jesus is waiting for Jesus to do something in us. First John 4, uh, 12 through 17. And I'm sorry, again, I know I'm going to be long and I'm not done. If everybody's got someplace they got to go, go. I'm not going to be offended. I'm just going to keep on keeping on, praise the Lord, because I can't quit until I get this thing down. Amen. I, I, I'm serious, man. I mean, I've been through this myself personally. It, just, it was just fortunate for me to be in an environment where speaking in tongues was not only accepted or it was expected. It's a kind of an environment where it's much easier to just receive it than the average person gets to experience. And I'm just trying to tell you, it wasn't the atmosphere that made me receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit. It was me just saying, okay, I want this. And then be willing to step out in faith and begin to speak. It's just a small thing. But that is the first step in opening yourself up to everything else that the Holy Spirit wants to do in your life. It's acknowledging Right? So, no man has seen God at any time. If we love one another, God dwells in us and his love is perfected in us. Hereby know we that we dwell in him and he in us because he hath given us of his spirit. And we have seen and do testify that the Father sent the Son to be the Savior of the world. Whosoever shall confess that Jesus is the Son of God, God dwells in him and he in God. And we have known and believed the love that God has to us. God is love, and he that dwelleth in love dwelleth in God, and God in him. Herein is our love made perfect, that we may have boldness in the day of judgment. Because as he is, so are we in this world. Now, doesn't that make more sense in the context of what I'm trying to talk about this morning, right? But look what he says. Herein is our love made perfect. Go back to verse 12, if you can, Suzanne. No man has seen God at any time. If we love one another, God dwelleth in us, and his love is perfected in us. Now back to 17 again. I know I'm flipping the charts back there. Herein is our love made perfect, that we may have boldness in the day of judgment, because as he is, so are we in this world. 
So that word perfect means complete. And the thought is, if God dwells in us, his love can be completed through our lives. In other words, his love is perfected through us. Right? That's what he's saying. So he, 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 he's given us this idea that his love can be completed through our lives. And the implication is that his life cannot be made complete except it finds expression in us. Can you see what kind of uh, confidence you might say that God has placed in us? If God dwells in us, then His love can be completed through us. And the implication again is that His life cannot be made complete except it finds expression through us. See how limited God was until Jesus came. You know what I mean? In terms of being known. He was thought to be everything and anything except what he what really was. Love. Merciful. One, a saving God. He was thought to be everything but that. Until Jesus came and was able to complete the picture of God. And he says now, the only way this thing can be carried out the only way his love can be perfected or completed is through us. He's limited himself, his, re his revelation, to you and I. That is awesome. I mean, God looks down, and we're, we're thinking, God, God, what a powerful God. And God's saying, and it's through these weak human vessels that I'm going to reveal myself and show myself to be mighty, that they cannot argue that that was God. Men and women can't do that. Men and women don't do that. There has to be a God. That's what they sought with Jesus. Surely, God is with us. Because they'd never seen a man operate that way. And God said, I want my entire body to function like that. You talk about an end time revival? Because this is the thing that started everything in the book of Acts. Their knowledge of this. Their awareness of this. John 1, 16 through 18. Praise God. And of His fullness have all we received and grace for grace. For the law was given by Moses, but grace and truth came by Jesus Christ. No man has seen God at any time. The only begotten Son, which is in the bosom of the Father, He hath declared Him. Praise God. No man has seen God at any time. The only begotten Son, which is in the bosom of the Father, He declared Him. That's our job. That's what we are supposed to do. Not by being perfect, not by not having human you know, conditions, but by the focus being on the God that's in us and not the human that's around us. See, it, 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 it leads you to believe they're imperfect, right? He says, incomplete. So there's something lacking in this perfection or this completion except as it works in and through our lives. Am I making sense? The only reason you saw the fullness of the Godhead in Jesus is because it worked through His life. And it has to do the same thing through us. So we have to be conscious of the Holy Spirit. We have to be conscious of our oneness with God. Without any reservations. Without any, you know, second guessing because of something I said or did or thought. God sees me perfect, righteous, holy. So grace is love at work. God's love. And it brought about a complete redemption for mankind. Or God so loved the world, right? By His grace, Christ has tasted death for every man. He's borne the diseases and the pain of all humanity. And yet, 
the word of reconciliation, reconciliation that he said, I, I will bring the redemption that's in Christ to man, can now only be given through us. Jesus isn't doing it anymore absent us. God isn't doing it without us. So this word of reconciliation that Jesus came to bring to man can only be further given to man by us. And there isn't a new way to do it. It has to be the same way, by the Spirit. If the body of Christ isn't under direction of and through the Holy Spirit, then God's love cannot be expressed. And God cannot do what God only can do. No man has seen God at any time, right? But if he can indwell the body of Christ, as he did Jesus Christ himself, then his love can find expression and reach humanity. I've given you the message of reconciliation, he says, and that's his message to us. If we let him, then the world can see or the world can behold his glory today, the same as it did in Jesus. And behold the works of his love as they did when God tabernacled among men in Christ. Think about it. He said, darkness, gross darkness upon the face of the earth, but my light will shine brighter. Why? Because his light is everywhere now. It's not just in Jesus in one man. It's everywhere on the planet. When the body wakes up to this and begins to operate by the Spirit, that light's going to shine and it's going to take the darkness away. Yes. Praise the Lord. And that, as like Tim was talking about, he needs to go to Samaria. Well, he needs to let his light shine in me. He needs to let his light shine in Tim. He needs to let his light shine. It's, it's got to shine in all of us for it to take away the darkness across the face of this earth. Jesus called the Holy Spirit, he, said, he called it the paraclete. And that means, the word actually uh, is defined to be to call to one's aid. So that's what the Holy Spirit is. Christ has come to us in the Holy Spirit to help us. The paraclete is to take the things that are Christ and reveal them to men. The early church went forth in the power of the Holy Spirit. That's how it worked. That's how they had the, the revival that they experienced. It turned the whole world upside down. Now, here's the deal. Now, let me try to quickly get through this. Natural man's knowledge is totally received through the physical senses. It's limited. And we know that. So the result is there's a reality here, and it's that there are two classes of knowledge or two types of knowledge. The knowledge of the natural man and the knowledge that comes from God. So you can see why revelation isn't recognized by the scholastic world. You're not going to find revelation uh, in the universities. You'll find very little of it even in seminaries. Because it doesn't belong to the realm of knowledge that man has gained through physical contact with matter. Right? It doesn't come through... Two and two is four. It doesn't come from just our contact. The way we kind of to relate to Jesus is different than the way we relate to the Holy Spirit. Why? Because we have physical contact in a sense that we don't have with the Holy Spirit. In other words, we have something physical we can relate to. And that's why universities and intellect will never receive the knowledge of God that way. They can receive it, but it has to be by the Spirit because they cannot receive it through the physical senses doesn't come that way. 1 Corinthians uh, 2, 10 through 13. But God has revealed them unto us by His Spirit. For the Spirit searcheth all things, yea, the deep things of God. For what man knoweth the things of a man, save the spirit of man which is in him? Even so the things of God knoweth no man but the spirit of God. So the physical things that you can, you can understand through physical contact, that's all the world knows. And he tells us that, that the, the reason we understand it is because of the spirit. Right? For what man knoweth the things of a man, save the spirit of man which is in him? Even so the things of God knoweth no man but the spirit of God. Now we have received not the spirit of the world but the Spirit which is of God, that we might know the things that are freely given to us by God, or of God. Which things also we speak, not in the words which man's wisdom teaches, physical sense realm, 
but which the Holy Ghost teaches, comparing spiritual things with spiritual. Right? That's why it's almost impossible to have a conversation with somebody if the Holy Ghost isn't dealing with them. So likewise, limited to sense knowledge, we cannot know God who is a spirit. You can't. But he's given to us in human words a knowledge of himself. This is spirit and it's life, Jesus said, right? And so the spirit combines spiritual truth with spiritual words. Revelation declares that it's, it's, it's saying what would be completely impossible if it weren't for a revelation from God. That's what revelation is, right? You get a revelation from God and it, it's telling you something that would be entirely impossible if it weren't for the fact that you had a revelation, right? All things work together for good to them that love God. Right? You say that to somebody who's not a believer who does not have the Spirit of God, and they're going to say, oh, yeah? Well, let me tell you about this thing that happened or that thing that happened or whatever. Why? Because it's revelation to us. It bears witness with us. The Word makes sense. But to somebody who doesn't have the Spirit, it doesn't. See, revelation declares what would be completely impossible if it were not a revelation from God. Right? I mean, it would be crazy if it weren't a revelation. And that's why people tell you, you're nuts to believe that. Right? I mean, it, it says, if man will believe with his heart and confess with his mouth. What is he talking about? He says, receiving it by the Spirit and then speaking spirit words, it's a reality. Romans 10, 9, 10. I mean, just for example, and he that believeth, lay hands on the sick and they will recover. Now that's insane, unless you're a believer, unless it's revelation. Am I right? I mean, any, to say that to somebody who's a non-believer, they go, yeah, right, right. No, it has to be revel it has to be a word of the Spirit. And then we believe it. And it's only crazy to people who don't have the Spirit. Isn't it weird how it makes perfect sense to us? But it's so alien to anybody who doesn't have the Spirit of God or who doesn't believe. So if thou, if thou shalt confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and shall believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. That's the Bible. Now, I know we can talk about baptism and, and uh, you know, lots of other things. Uh, but I'm saying, here's the simplicity of this. And you can't argue with it. And here's the deal. It's just like talking in tongues. The average person won't do it because they can't get past the thought of it. It's that simple. That all I have to do is say, Jesus, I believe that you died for my sins. And that God raised you. And you're alive forevermore. I believe that in my heart. And then I confess it with my mouth. And the scripture says I'm born again. Praise God. God's raised you from the dead. Then you're saved. For with the heart, with the spirit, see? Not with the intellect, but it's with the spirit that man believes unto righteousness. And with the mouth, confession is made unto salvation. So I believe it in my spirit. Right? And now it doesn't matter what somebody says. You've got to do this. You've got to do that. I've got to say, look, I'm cool. I, I don't, I'm not worried about it. But here's what, let me tell you something. I have believed and I have a witness. And you cannot take that away from me. I don't care what demands you try to place on me. Hallelujah. That's the Spirit of God. That's the love of God. Bearing witness with our spirit. Amen. Praise God. The fact that there are two kinds of knowledge is one of the basic truths that faith is based on. When we understand clearly the fact that there are two kinds of knowledge... And then we begin to learn to discern or distinguish between the two. The walk of faith becomes a natural walk for us. Supernatural to others, but natural to us. That's why he says you have to renew your mind to the Word of God. Because it is a block. It will, it will hinder the Holy Spirit from producing in your life. Right? Because if we let our brains go, it's saying, uh-huh, 
Yeah, well, the Holy Spirit, but you, you probably quenched it because you're such a jerk and you act like an idiot and you say things and do things, right? I've got to renew my mind to what God says about me, not what I'm saying about me or not what the devil is saying or somebody else. That's the challenge. Amen? To get our mind and, well, I won't use the military term, but look, to get your mind and spirit wired together. Am I right? <laughs> Praise the Lord. So everything's working together. Amen? That's it. That's, that is the truth of the matter, though. Amen? So in Romans, let, let's quickly, let, let's get to this. Romans 8 and we'll, 1 through 8. And we know these, so I'm not going to spend a whole lot of time other than to try to bring some sense uh, this morning to, to what I'm saying in the context that I'm talking about. So in uh, Romans 8, chapter 1, he says, There is therefore now no condemnation who, to them which are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the physical man, but after the union or, or, or unitedness of us with Christ. For the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made me free from the law of sin and death. I'm free from the laws that govern my flesh. In other words, before I was born again, when this flesh acted up, there was a potential punishment coming. There was eventual punishment coming, amen, for my acts and deeds that were done uh, in my own body. But once I come to Christ, all that was put on Him, and now I have to think in those terms. I'm a spirit being now. I, it, I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm not accountable for everything I do in my body. Now, I am accountable to you, but not to Him. There are consequences still for behavior, but it has nothing to do with my relationship with God. I mean, I run up and smack somebody upside the head, I'm liable to get decked. There won't be God that knocks me down, it'll be the guy or the person that I hit. Right? So there's consequences for behavior, but it's not God's punishment. It's just our stupid acts, and, and then there's things that come as a result of that. But the righteousness of the law, that the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. So everything the law demanded, as far as God's concerned, we've kept. Because Jesus did. Right? For they that are after the flesh do mind the things of the flesh. But they that are of the Spirit, the things that are of the Spirit. To be carnally minded is death. To be spiritually minded is life and peace. Because the carnal mind is, at, is an enemy of God or, or at, at odds with God. It's not subject to the law of God, neither indeed can be. Can't even relate to it. So then, they that are in the flesh cannot please God. That's hard to understand, except that we realize the contrast here is two walks. The walk of flesh, or the walk of the senses, or the walk of the spirit, or being one with God. So in verse 9, next verse. But you're not in the flesh. You're not of the sense realm. Not since you got born again, but in the spirit. If so be, the spirit of God dwell in you. If you've been born again, you're not, God doesn't see you that way, and you shouldn't see yourself that way, because now you are a new creature. A new creation. You are a spirit person. Amen. If any man have not the spirit of Christ, then he's none of Christ. Then he's not connected with it. That's the world that's around us that is not born again. Right? And so flesh is a person, basically, that is not born again. Or a person that's born again and doesn't know the difference. Right? So the person that's not born again lives purely in the realm of the physical senses. Now that's a problem with religion because they've kept people there. So the, even though they were born again, they were still forced to live as though they were not born again. Like it's something more you got to do in order to get favor from God or to get God to do something for you or what have you. So when man died spiritually, he became alienated from God. Right? He ceased to live in the spirit. Right? And we know he did because immediately he goes, well, I'm naked. Sense. He, that sense never bothered him. It never, it never influenced him till that moment. Amen? And so he's fallen from the realm of omnipotence. He's, in other words, he's estranged from God. And what happened? Words lost their power. God says, now you're going to have to do it by the sweat of your brow. You're not going to be naming things anymore. You're going to be working your butt off just to stay alive. Not just to feed yourself and your family. Words lost power. 
Man became dependent on his physical ability, the abilities of his own body and his own intellect. That was the only way he could exist. Everything that he should know about the world he lives in became dependent on his five senses. But having been born again, receiving the Holy Spirit, it brings to life our spirit. It renews us. It restores us to our original condition. Come back to our rightful realm, the normal realm for us, which is supernatural to the flesh. See, by being made alive spiritually through the impartation of God's life to our spirit, we can walk again in his realm, the realm of the spirit. Listen to this, the realm of omnipotence. Unlimited power, unlimited resource. That's where we fell from, and that's where he brought us back to. To where now our words have power again, just like God's, because the Holy Spirit quickens them, makes them come alive to us. Because our spirit is one with him. The realm of faith, where words filled with omnipotence call things that are not as though they were and they become. I'm not going to go back to it, but in Romans 8, 5, and 7, it said the mind of the flesh is at enmity with God because it's a mind that only lives by the evidence of the five senses, excluding God, excluding spiritual and faith life. You want to know why our government is never going to be able to produce for us what we need? Because they're not spiritual. There may be some spiritual people there. But it doesn't function by spiritual truths. It functions by the senses. I, I, I'm not against this country. You know, you know that. I mean, I, it's, it's got problems, obviously. It's got issues. It's because it's filled with people. But the reason this nation survived as long as it has, even with all of its faults, is because of its foundation. And we need to get back to that foundation not just in thoughts, but in the way we actually live. But verse 6 says it's death. It's enmity. It's death because to carnally minded is death, right? It's death because it belongs to the death-doomed body that is going to die. Even if we get raptured, the flesh is going to die. We get, we're changed in an instant. In the twinkling of an eye, we get a glorified body. And the reason why it's a doomed body because it can't reveal God to man so they could receive his life. The mind of the spirit is the mind that lives by the word, not the evidence of the physical senses. Man should not live by bread alone, Jesus said. That word, when he uses that word bread, he's talking about physical, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. He said, we sh we, man should not live by the sense realm, by the physical realm. We should live by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. I'm going to wrap this up, okay? We live in oneness with God, and we do it by the authority of what God has revealed to us. Amen? To be in the word. What he's told us we are in his word. That's how we have to live. Faith is fearlessly acting on what God has said, in spite of how insane it looks to the natural man. I remember Don talking, and this is just one example, and I could, we could all have multiple ones, but I remember Don talking about standing on the Bible. I mean, the natural man would say, oh my God, stand on the Bible? That's blasphemy. I mean, God, you're, you're liable to get hit by lightning or something. You're taking the word of God. You know, and, and, and walking in a circle or saying the things that we say. Why? Because it sounds insane to somebody who the Spirit is not speaking to. 
who cannot hear what the Spirit is saying. It has to be done because it's by revelation. And so fearlessly we step out and do it, and no matter how crazy it seems to the natural mind, because we know there's a witness in here that's saying, that's how it's going to happen. Praise the Lord. Let me just give you, let's wrap up with these scriptures. I'm going to give you four more scriptures and then we'll close. Luke chapter 1, verse 37. Just to etch this in your minds and memories, praise the Lord. Luke 1, for, uh, chapter 37. For with God, nothing shall be impossible. Now, when we're faced with all kinds of physical evidence to the contrary, it's difficult. But that's the truth. And that's what the Holy Spirit is telling us. Amen? Isaiah 55 and 11. He says, My word that I've sent to you will not come back to me void. If it finds a believer, if it finds a spirit-filled person, it will produce what the Spirit sent it to produce. It just echoes what the Spirit has said. So shall my word be that goeth forth out of my mouth. It will not return unto me void. It will accomplish that which I please, and it will prosper in the thing whereto I sent it. Romans 12, 2. And be not conformed to this world, to the sense realm, to where everything in the senses is what you're going by, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind so that you may prove what is that good, acceptable, and perfect will of God. So you can prove it. Not so God can prove it. He's already proven it. Now he needs us to prove it. Last scripture here, Ephesians 4, 23 and 24. And be renewed in the spirit of your mind. So that your mind and your spirit become connected in one. And that you put on the new man. The born again man which after God is created in righteousness and true holiness. Put him on every day. You've got to put him on probably multiple times a day because you're trying to convince yourself that you're not that. And if you aren't, the devil is. <laughs> Amen? So let's start living like we're omnipotent. Like there is no power not given to us. All things are possible. To them that believe. Nothing shall be impossible to them that believe. The Holy Spirit in your spirit, God in us, one. Now live by it. And God's ability will be your ability. Praise the Lord. We just got to remind ourselves throughout the day, renew our mind to who and what we really are. And I'm telling you, we're living in the fullness of time. In the time when God is going to start doing things through His church. Why? Not because God's doing something new, but because we've woken up to what it is He's wanting to do through us. And that we have the capability of doing it because of what He has made us in Christ. No limits. I, I just encourage everybody. Pray in tongues. Just make that a start. Just start there. And see if God won't begin to open up other doors and help you to realize the potential that he's placed in each and every one of us. Amen? Amen. Give the Lord a hand clap this morning. Praise God. <laughs> amen. Amen. God bless you. Thank you for your patience. I know I went really long today, but I really do feel like God's trying to get some things out to the body and helping us to start growing up into maturity of omnipotence. Hallelujah. God, I love that word. You're dismissed in Jesus' name. Yes, Ron. Yes, that's You're right. Too late. That's it. He said, you can't convince me other. It's you too late. Yep. Once you received it, hey. That greatest witness we'll ever have that's is right. the witness of the Holy Spirit in each one of us. Love you all. God bless you. Have a great week.